Welcome back to another free training resource by the U.S. Strategic Service. My name is Eric and I will be leading this period of instruction. Today's training discusses armed officers, policies and procedures. Today's training will be an introduction to armed security and it will discuss training specific to armed officers, authorized and restricted equipment, how to set up and wear your duty belt, as well as weapons safety lessons. I want to be clear that these policies are developed to conform with regulations in the state of Maryland. Obviously, there's no way for me to foresee every law and regulation across all 50 states and every county and municipality within the US. But these topics are pretty generic and broad enough that they'll give you a good idea both into what it's like to do armed security and a good introduction to safety lessons and weapons handling. Security officers may not carry a firearm unless the security officer is licensed, authorized, and carrying proof such as their handgun permit, weapon card, or license. The security officer must be engaged in the performance of duties as a security officer or traveling directly to or from the place of assignment. Local laws may restrict the carrying of a firearm while traveling to or from the place of assignment, but in most jurisdictions, this provision is allowed. Always comply with local laws if they are more restrictive than this policy. The security officer must be in proper uniform and the firearm must be in plain view. This means that if you're wearing a winter jacket, the weapon must be exposed over top of the jacket. And in a lot of jurisdictions, non-uniform security such as suit and tie details require an additional license. Here in Maryland, that would be a private investigator's license. Authorized firearms, or I should say the most commonly authorized firearms, officers should only carry the class of firearm that they have qualified for during their certification course. Officers are authorized to carry the semi-automatic or any of the following revolver actions as allowed by the governing state or location of the post. And this is important because in Maryland, when you conduct your handgun training, there is a distinction between semi-automatic and revolver, and you have to be qualified for one or both to carry. However, for a long time in Washington, D.C., as a special police officer, only revolvers were authorized. So again, please follow any local laws that are more restrictive than this policy may be. But most common authorized firearms calibers include 9mm, 10mm, 40, 45, 38, and 357. Regardless of state laws, it is never a good idea to carry a single action revolver. This is what you would refer to as an old western or cowboy gun. A single action revolver can only be fired after you have manually pulled back the hammer to engage the weapon. A dual action revolver can be operated by just pulling the trigger, but you can also engage the hammer as well. But a single action is not a good idea, being that it will not fire unless you have performed the additional action of engaging the hammer. The most commonly authorized barrel sizes are between three and six inches. No armed security officer or personal protection officer shall carry an inoperative, unsafe, replica, or simulated firearm while on duty. This is not only stupid, it is dangerous because as the firearm is in plain view and people may seek your assistance for certain matters, you might find yourself in a situation where it turns out you really needed an actual handgun and the facsimile firearm that you are carrying can get you into a world of trouble. As an armed security officer, there may be a rare instance when firing your weapon is justified. However, armed security officers should always consider the following statement before unholstering and firing their weapon. Officers should only fire their weapon if they believe their life 
or the life of another innocent person is in imminent danger. The officer is responsible for knowing the local laws and regulations regarding the use of force and lethal force in defense of a person. The officer is expected to comply with all laws and regulations at all times. No armed security officer or personal protection officer shall brandish, point, exhibit, or otherwise display a firearm at any time, except as authorized by law. And a good example to cite in this slide is that within the state of Maryland, you actually have a duty to flee from conflict and use self-defense only as an absolute last resort with no other option. But the law favors you fleeing conflict at any time. And this is opposite of what is known as a castle doctrine or the stand your ground law. If someone is advancing on you, it's your duty to flee from them and only use self-defense if there is no route of escape or no other reasonable alternative. The discharge of a firearm while on duty by an armed officer shall be reported to the agency's regional office immediately and the appropriate state licensing board within 24 hours. The information to be reported shall include name of the person who discharged the firearm, name of the employer, the location of the incident, a brief narrative of what happened, whether death, personal injury, or property damage resulted, and whether the incident is being or was investigated by a law enforcement agency. Most licensing jurisdictions do have a mandated report period for the discharge of a firearm and some also simply for the brandishing or the unholstering of a firearm. Again, it's up to you to know your local laws. Armed security officers are typically not permitted to carry a concealed handgun or other weapon while in uniform or while in performance of their duties as a licensed security officer. When we get further into use of force training and we talk about officer presence, it doesn't make any sense for you to be armed as a uniformed security officer and to not have the weapon visible in plain view. Long story short, it serves as a deterrent and it can deter, let's just say 90% of your problems. And this is also besides the fact of if the weapon is not in plain view, if it's covered by some article of clothing, when you really need it, you're going to be glad that it was more easily accessible by being in plain view. While on duty, armed security officers employed by the agency must always carry an unexpired armed security officer pocket card, or as we call them in Maryland, a handgun permit, issued to them by their local licensing agency. Upon request from a peace officer, a supervisor, or manager, or an investigator employed by the local licensing agency, the armed security officer must present their card. We recommend that all officers carry firearms that employ a non-trigger safety mechanism. Officers should engage the safety mechanism, if present, at all times. Officers are to carry a fully loaded firearm at all times. A fully loaded firearm means that the magazine or cylinder contains the maximum number of rounds per the manufacturer's specifications, and it is ready to fire upon releasing the safety mechanism. Again, in terms of inadvertently entering an incident where your firearm is needed, in self-defense or defense of another innocent person. It doesn't make sense to have an extra step involved with implementing the handgun if you don't carry it with a round in the chamber. You must always carry a fully loaded firearm ready to go simply by disengaging the safety mechanism. In these incidents, milliseconds matter. Unless restricted by law, officers are to only carry commercially manufactured hollow point ammunition. Officers are to carry at least one additional fully loaded magazine or one speed loader for revolvers on their duty belt. But in actuality, it's industry standard to carry two spare magazines on your duty belt. Officers should never 
unholster their weapon unless an emergency situation justifying the use of lethal force dictates it, or if specifically requested by a supervisor, branch manager, peace officer, or state licensing board official. Officers must arrive to post with their firearms already loaded and secured in their holster. Can you imagine showing up to work at let's just say Food Lion if you do retail security and you go to load your handgun and you inadvertently fire around down aisle three. Client property is not the place to load your handgun unless there is a specific weapon loading and unloading area with a clearing barrel provided by the client. Otherwise, you must always maintain the weapon as fully loaded and have it in that condition prior to arriving at your assignment. While on duty, officers should never hand their firearm to another officer or place the firearm in a storage location unless an emergency situation dictates it. If these rare circumstances do occur, officers should always ensure that their firearms are placed on safety prior to removing the ammunition, ejecting the round, and surrendering the firearm. In addition to initial inspections and registration of an officer's firearm at hiring, periodic firearm inspections are conducted for all officers. During these inspections, supervisors are looking for the following. Verify the presence of the officer's handgun permit or whatever license your local law dictates that you have. Verify that the officer's firearm is registered with the agency. Verify the proper caliber and type ammunition for the officer's firearm and verify appropriate holster and duty belt. If you think I haven't conducted an inspection and found someone carrying a BB gun or a real gun with no ammunition, you would be highly surprised. So periodically, yes. As an operator, you need to inspect your officer's handguns. And as an officer, you need to expect your company to inspect your handgun to verify its functionality and that you're properly maintaining it. All officers are required to wear a level two double retention or higher duty holster. The holster must employ a retaining strap that is fashioned across the back of the firearm and a second form of retention, such as a side strap, middle finger release tab, or internal trigger lock. The holster is to be attached to the duty belt via belt loops or a belt pass-through. Paddle holsters are prohibited. I say that because paddle holsters are not a good idea. The goal of a double retention or higher duty holster is to make sure that no one can get this weapon from you. A paddle holster can literally just be unclipped from your belt. And you can sit here and tell me that you're a karate master and a self-defense expert and no one could ever get anything from you, but that is just not a good mindset. Things can happen. Accidents can take place. And the last thing you need is to introduce your fully loaded firearm into the general public by losing positive control of it, regardless of how that happens. Here you'll see some samples of acceptable holsters that are level two double retention or higher. These are some options from Safari Land, Black Hawk, Good and Goodrick, and Don Hume. I don't know. Let me know in the comments how to pronounce that. Some examples of holsters not acceptable for use on duty. At least two of these are paddle holsters and the other two are something you'd buy from Amazon or at a flea market. The retention in these holsters is not reliable enough that you should use it to secure a fully loaded firearm on your person. Pro tip, holsters that are advertised as universal or one size fits all generally do not fit the requirements for a duty holster. A properly worn duty belt has three components. The garrison belt, which is 1.25 to an inch and a half. It's a belt worn through the belt loops of the pants. The duty belt, typically two and a quarter inch. It's a belt worn to cover up the garrison belt. And this is the belt that you attach your holster and all of your equipment to. 
and then belt keepers, which are looped around the garrison belt and duty belt to lock them together. The holster is to be attached to the duty belt at the point of the strong side hip. The holster should be worn so that it is between the arm and hip when the arms are relaxed. If properly located on the duty belt, the holster should align with the seam on the side of the leg of the pants. The holster is to be worn with the butt of the pistol grip facing to the rear, as shown in the photo. Proper placement of reloads on the duty belt. For semi-automatic handguns, the magazine carrier should be placed on the duty belt so that they are easily accessible by the non-dominant hand. The two most common positions are one, on the point of the non-dominant hip with the magazines oriented vertically, or immediately adjacent to the belt buckle with the magazines oriented horizontally, as shown in the photos. The magazines should be placed in the carrier so that when grasped by the support hand, which is your non-dominant hand, the index finger rests on the front face of the magazine. And to clarify that a little bit, if you're wearing the magazines vertically, the front of the magazines should face the belt buckle. And if wearing them horizontally, the front of the magazine should face up. And when I say the front of the magazine, I'm talking about the direction in which the bullets are facing. For revolvers, the speed loader case should be placed on the duty belt adjacent to the belt buckle, on the same side as the duty holster. The speed loader should be placed in the case with the bullet tips facing downwards. OC is only allowed for officers that have submitted proof of training to their local office and only on select posts. So before you carry OC, make sure that your company approves you carrying it and that you'll receive the proper training. You can cause a lot of trouble through improperly using OC spray. And I'm just gonna leave it at that. Don't carry it unless you've been trained to use it. The OC pouch should be placed in front of the holster or on the support side, your non-dominant side. The OC pouch should be placed in front of the holster or on the support side. Never place it behind the holster as the OC pouch is small enough to wedge behind the firearm grip and can prevent you from being able to draw your firearm. What a nightmare scenario that would be. <laughs> Handcuffs are only allowed for officers that have submitted proof of training to the local office and only on select posts. So again, make sure you have been trained in the use and implementation of handcuffs. Same thing, believe it or not, you can cause a lot of harm to a person by improperly handcuffing them. So don't carry it unless A, your company has approved you to, and B, you've had the required training. The handcuff case should never be worn on the back of the belt over the spine. Steel handcuffs can cause serious spinal injuries if an officer were to fall on their back. If you carry handcuffs on duty, carry at least two keys in different locations. Every security officer should have a quality flashlight on them at all times. Carrying a large flashlight such as a mag light on a duty belt can cause the light to push up on the duty belt when the officer sits. This tends to cause the officer to sit with their hips unevenly leading to lower back pain. Flashlights should be worn on the side of the duty belt opposite of the holster. So the flashlight can be used with the support hand. Old style ring holders for flashlights should be avoided as they provide poor retention on the light and tend to allow them to drop from the duty belt. As I have said in every duty belt video I've done, pick up the Pelican 7600 rechargeable LED flashlight from Maryland Police Supply. Protective gloves can be invaluable to an officer. At least one pair should be carried at all times. Soft glove cases are ideal to utilize the space on the back of the belt where hard items shouldn't be carried. Cat tourniquets are an increasingly popular and effective tool for emergency life saving of gunshot victims. If you choose to carry one, please make sure to get proper training. Same thing as every other tool I've discussed. 
you can seriously harm somebody through the improper utilization of a tourniquet. CAT TQ cases are commonly carried behind the holster with a belt keeper spaced to keep it from sliding behind the pistol grip. A negligent discharge occurs anytime that a firearm is discharged by operator input without that action having been the specific intent of the operator. Negligent discharges can most commonly be attributed to a lack of training, poor quality of training, or a careless attitude towards safety. The highest risks of negligent discharges are drawing or holstering the firearm. Poor technique or holster design can lead to trigger pull during the drawing motion. Avoid using holster designs that require trigger finger manipulation to draw the firearm. Train to index the trigger finger in a position during the draw stroke that will prevent it from entering the firearm's trigger guard during the draw. Obstructions or debris in holsters can cause the trigger to be pulled while holstering as demonstrated in the photo. Avoid wearing loose clothing or jackets that can slip into the holster opening, especially windbreaker style draw cords. Always remove the magazine first. Clear the chamber second. Double and triple check to make sure that the chamber is empty. Never load or unload your firearm while on the job site. And we've already discussed why. Now, I'll introduce you to two concepts. One is sympathetic action. The body tends to mirror the actions of one hand with the other hand. The stronger the motion, the more likely the other hand is to mirror the action. Grasping tightly with one hand tends to make the other hand grasp. And startle reaction. A normal human reaction to a strong startle stimulus is to make a fist. If a finger is on the trigger, a startle reaction can easily apply enough force to the trigger to cause a negligent discharge. For these reasons, this is why we train to index the finger, to index the trigger finger on the slide of the handgun and off of the trigger and completely out of the trigger guard at all. Also, Failure to properly maintain a firearm can lead to negligent discharges, particularly when loading a firearm. Common wear items can cause a negligent discharge if their condition isn't monitored regularly. The most common are broken firing pins and worn hammer or safety sears. All firearms should be examined to ensure proper operation before being loaded. A holstered firearm is a safe firearm. While on duty, a firearm should only be removed from the holster in an emergency situation where life is endangered. Removing a firearm from the holster for any other reason may result in disciplinary action, most likely including termination. And it may not stop there because you could have your license suspended or revoked. Criminal charges or civil litigation is also a possibility. And I'm not saying these things to scare you. I'm saying them so that you understand why this training is important and why your competence in weapons handling and safety matters. Always keep your finger off the trigger until ready to fire. Always remove your finger from the trigger if the need to shoot is removed. Index your finger along the frame above the trigger so that sympathetic actions and startle reactions cannot cause the trigger to be pulled. Always follow the four golden rules of firearm safety. Always treat every firearm as though it is loaded. Never let the muzzle cover anything you're not willing to destroy. Keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target and be sure of your target and what lies beyond it. Failing to properly inspect store and maintain your firearm and its ammunition can lead to conditions that can result in the firearm being dangerous to use. Bullet setback is a condition that can happen to ammunition that has been chambered more than one time. The force of the bullet being pushed against the feed ramp on the barrel can cause the bullet to be pushed into the casing. 
Discharging ammunition with a setback can cause dangerous pressure spikes that can destroy the firearm and injure the shooter. Ammunition that appears to have setback should be discarded. To clarify, this is something that can happen when you continually load and unload and reload the same bullet over and over again. If you unload your firearm, that bullet needs to then be rotated to the bottom of the magazine and a new one loaded each time. Otherwise, this is what can happen. The cartridge on the right demonstrates dangerous setback and should not be used. This cartridge should be disposed of properly, which does not include throwing bullets in the trash. <laughs> Most often, I would say turn it over to law enforcement, let them dispose of it. Or you could probably also turn it into a gun store. Corrosion on brass ammunition cases causes pitting in the case and can weaken the case or make the case brittle. Brittle brass can fail to seal the chamber on firing, allowing gas to blow back at the shooter or the case may even crack and fail when fired. It is important to routinely inspect the ammunition and replace any that shows corrosion. Case in point. Most of these cartridges show dangerous levels of corrosion and should not be used. These cartridges should be disposed of properly. Again, don't throw them in the trash. Here is an example of a firearm destroyed by a case failure. Gas from the failed case has cracked the magazine, pushed it out of the grip, split the grip, and pushed the magazine release button out of the weapon. Keep in mind, somebody's hand was there when this occurred. Board obstructions can occur when firearms are improperly stored, carried in a manner that allows debris to enter the gun, or when dropped muzzle down. Firearms that are carried on duty should frequently be checked for bore obstructions and need to be cleaned regularly to prevent buildup of debris in the bore. Pro tip, checking for bore obstructions means you should probably clear the firearm first. <laughs> Don't look down the barrel of a loaded gun, please. An example of a firearm destroyed by a bore obstruction. A ruptured barrel caused by a bore obstruction has blown off the bottom portion of the frame, including the recoil spring, assembly, and trigger guard. And again, remember, somebody's hand was there when this occurred. The agency does not have an official policy on what you do with your firearms while off duty. However, here are some tips to help keep you and your equipment safe. Under your car seat in the glove box or center console are poor places to store a firearm and are generally the first place checked by thieves. If you must store your firearm in your vehicle, it is strongly suggested that you make use of a dedicated safe permanently mounted to the frame of the car. Never attempt to place a trigger lock on a loaded firearm. The lock itself can pull the trigger, causing the firearm to discharge. Always unload the firearm before installing a trigger lock. Cable locks that pass through the action of the firearm are much more safe. And the last tip I will give to you is that a hidden firearm is not a safely stored firearm. Obscurity is not security. Store your firearm where only authorized individuals can get to it. And that concludes this introductory armed security handgun training. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments or send them over to me on Instagram at the security consultant. And I will catch you in the next video. Mm -hmm.